To listen to American Scandal one week early and ad-free, join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. It's July 14th, 1999 in the French Alps. Lance Armstrong steps onto a wide balcony at a ski resort. He's 6,000 feet above sea level and surrounded by snow-capped mountains. From here, Armstrong can even look down at the clouds. He feels like a god, and he knows that feeling is well-earned. Earlier today, Armstrong powered through the 10th stage of the Tour de France. It was a hellish ride, one that curved up through endless mountain roads. But with this stage over, Armstrong now appears on track to win the whole tour. It's his third time competing in the Tour de France, but finally, this is his moment to be crowned the greatest cyclist in the world. Throughout this tour, Armstrong made a vow to himself. He wouldn't let anyone stop him from taking the trophy, which is why, right now, he needs to take care of some business. He learned about a threat that's looming on the horizon, one that could derail his entire career, and Armstrong knows he needs to get ahead of it before it's too late. Armstrong steps into the restaurant inside the ski resort. He spots his teammates, who are all sitting at a long table. But there's also another person at the table, a balding man wearing a thick gray sweater. In front of him is a small tape recorder. His name is Samuel Apt, and he's a reporter with the New York Times. Armstrong invited Apt to join him at this dinner, and while the reporter doesn't know it, Armstrong needs to use him to protect himself. Armstrong approaches the table and takes a seat. Hey, Sam, glad you can make it. Well, I'm good to start this interview whenever you are. Yeah, of course, Lance, but first, I gotta say, I'm surprised you wanted to do an interview. I mean, we're in the middle of a race. Well, I don't want to sound too cocky, but come on, you really see someone else taking first? Well, honestly, Lance, yeah, I think you got it. And it's a big deal. You'll be the first American to win since Lamond. And Lamond didn't have to come back from cancer. <laughs> no, no, he didn't, that's true. Well, Sam, I'm glad you see that, because here's the thing. It seems like some people aren't so happy I'm about to win. I learned that they're spreading some lies, saying that I juice. The reporter scribbles something in his notepad. That's good, Armstrong thinks. He's taken the first piece of bait. It's not that Armstrong wants the New York Times to investigate whether he's actually doping. It's just the opposite. He's trying to get ahead of the issue, to get the newspapers to take his side, because he has a problem. He was just tipped off that one of his urine samples contained traces of performance-enhancing drugs. Now, a French newspaper is going to report this. So Armstrong needs to get some good press from the New York Times, something he can use to defend himself against the attack. Apt, the reporter, finishes taking notes and looks up from his notepad. Well, Lance, who says you're doping? I haven't heard anything. Ah, uh, start making calls. It's out there. But come on, we both know there's nothing true about the allegation. Well, okay... Lance, but tell me, if they don't have proof, what do you have to worry about? Look, you've covered cycling for a long time, right? You know the Europeans hate the Americans. They think it's their sport. So would you put it past these people to just to make up some kind of evidence? Well, Lance, it's true. The Europeans are protective about cycling. But fabricating evidence? Yeah, I don't know about that. Sam, don't be naive about this. They're trying to frame me. I know it, and I think you know it. And it's a story, one that you should follow up on. The reporter looks away for a moment. Armstrong can tell that he's chewing this over. Then Apt turns back and picks up his pen. Well, Lance, you could be right. I do appreciate you coming to me with this story, but I have to ask, can you unequivocally deny that you use performance-enhancing drugs? Sam, come on. I've been on my deathbed. I would never, never be stupid enough to take those kind of drugs. Never. Okay. Well... I'll check it out, see if there's anything behind it. But uh, thanks for the tip. And more importantly, good luck with the race. Apt shuts off his recorder and rises. As he walks out of the restaurant, Armstrong tries to hold back a giant grin. He's confident that his plan was a success. Once again, he reminded a friendly journalist that he should be treated sympathetically, that Armstrong is a hero who overcame a life-threatening illness and any accusations of doping are nothing more than lies fueled by jealousy. Lance knows it's a good story, and the American public will eat it up. But the truth is Armstrong has been doping almost every day for years, and he's not planning to stop. 
Not when he's becoming the best cyclist in the world. And certainly not when he's this close to winning the Tour de France. American Scandal is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed in 2020. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. American Scandal is sponsored by ADT. No matter what you want to protect, nobody has more experience helping keep it safe than ADT. Over the years, ADT has received the most burglar alarm events in the industry and helped save more lives than any other home security provider. U.S. News has voted them the best home security system of 2020. Strategy Analytics 2020 agrees, calling ADT the number one smart home security provider. And it's no wonder why. ADT has over 20,000 experienced employees to help keep you safe and give you 24-7 peace of mind. Experience matters. That's why millions of people trust ADT to protect what matters most and help keep them safe. Get all the latest security upgrades from the largest name in home security. Visit ADT.com today. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In the late 1990s, Lance Armstrong rose to the top in the world of professional cycling. He'd survived a fight with cancer and still managed to crush the competition. But what few people knew is that Lance Armstrong was using performance-enhancing drugs, and new recruits to his team were expected to follow suit. Armstrong knew that if the truth came out, his career and reputation would be ruined. So he embarked on a ruthless crusade to conceal his drug use. He lied to and manipulated the press, and he made sure that anyone who spoke out against him would live to regret it. This is episode two, Work Hard, Play Hard. It's August 1999 in Washington, D.C. Lance Armstrong strides down a corridor, surrounded by men and women in suits. They turn a corner, and suddenly he can feel something shift. Everything seems more quiet and serious. Armstrong turns to a nearby woman and asks if this is it. She nods. They're now in the west wing of the White House. Armstrong shakes his head in disbelief. For some reason, he can't stop smiling. It's not only that just a month ago he won the Tour de France. That victory was a highlight of his entire life. But now everything has begun moving so fast. In the past few days, he's been making public speeches. He's been interviewed on talk shows. Armstrong even rang the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. But now, as he walks through the West Wing of the White House, his success feels even bigger. Armstrong was invited to speak with Al Gore, the Vice President of the United States. Armstrong knows that he's become a national symbol of resilience and hope, and he now commands the attention of the most important leaders in America. And that's good news. Because if Armstrong can persuade someone like Al Gore to publicly support him, then he'll win over the media even more. Reporters won't go digging too far into his past, and his use of performance-enhancing drugs will remain a secret. Soon, Armstrong reaches the Roosevelt Room in the West Wing. He takes a seat. A moment later, the door swings open and Vice President Al Gore enters the room. Armstrong feels a little sheepish. This is one of the most powerful people in the world. But Gore helps put Armstrong at ease and congratulates him on his win at the Tour de France. For a few minutes, the two discuss cycling and all the struggles Armstrong has faced as a cancer survivor. It's then that Armstrong sees an opening to lobby Al Gore for his public support. Armstrong tells the vice president that he needs his help. His charity, the Lance Armstrong Foundation, helps raise awareness about cancer. Recently, it's had a surge in donations. But Armstrong says he wants to take things a step further, and he needs the public support of people like the vice president. Gore nods, and his face grows stern. And right away, Armstrong realizes that the easy conversation is over. It's time to negotiate with the vice president of the United States. 
Armstrong begins heaping praise on Gore. He says it's great news that Gore is now running for president in the next election. He'd make an excellent leader. And Armstrong adds he has a suggestion. If he's elected, Gore should make the fight against cancer a top priority. Gore nods, and in a noncommittal way, he says he'll do everything he can if he wins. Armstrong can sense that Gore wants to move on to another subject. But he knows he can't stop now, not if he wants the support of such a powerful figure. So Armstrong tells Gore that he feels an obligation to stand up for people who are battling cancer. That's part of the reason why he pushed so hard to win the Tour de France. He wanted to show people with cancer that they could still be winners. Armstrong then hammers home the final point. He may be famous, but he's only a cyclist. Gore could be the next president. And in that position, Gore could really make a difference if he prioritized the fight against cancer. The vice president leans back, thinking for what seems an eternity. But then finally he smiles and nods. He says that if he's elected president, he promises he'll do everything in his power to help Armstrong's cause. Armstrong thanks Gore, and the meeting comes to an end. A few moments later, Armstrong walks again through the West Wing and heads toward an exit. As Armstrong steps out onto the street, he finds that once again he can't stop smiling. He's the most famous cyclist in the world, a national icon. And now he's about to get the public support of the man many say will be the next president of the United States. So now nothing stands in the way. A year later, Lance Armstrong lies in bed in a hotel suite in southeast France. Across the room, a TV is replaying highlights from today's race in the Tour de France. Once again, Armstrong is in the lead. He's on track to defend his title from last year. But Armstrong barely notices the TV or all the glowing coverage of his performance. Instead, he's focused on the needle that's now hooked up to his arm, connected to a tube, which leads to a plastic bag that's full of blood. Armstrong watches the bag run empty as the blood is transferred into his veins. Armstrong then looks across the room at two of his teammates. They're also hooked up to needles and bags of blood. But one of the teammates, Tyler Hamilton, looks concerned and upset. Armstrong realizes that once again, he needs to step up and be a leader for his teammates. Armstrong sits up on the bed. Hey, Tyler, you got a funny look on your face. What's wrong? Oh, nothing, Lance. Just... How much longer is this going to take? I don't know. Maybe a few minutes? But look, you got to relax. I know. It, uh, it's just... Lance, this is risky. I mean, do, we don't really need to do this, do we? The team can probably win without the blood doping. Tyler probably isn't good enough for me. We have to win. Don't call it blood doping, okay? It's not doping. It's just a transfusion. Well, I don't know what the difference is. The difference is this machine, it extracts our own blood. Then a few weeks later, we take that blood and we put it back into our own bodies. And boom, extra mass for red blood cells. And Tyler, what does that do for us? <sighs> it gives us better endurance and performance. That's right, Tyler. Endurance, performance. Those sound like good things, don't they? Remember, we're racing the Tour de France. Hamilton shakes his head and looks away. Yeah, I, I don't know, Lance. I just, I just don't like it. You know, a lot of teams, they'd love to have a setup like this. Instead, they're injecting themselves with God knows what, all so they can be faster. And they're praying that the stuff doesn't show up in the urine test. But not the three of us. We don't have to worry about that because transfusions are undetectable. It's our own blood, for Christ's sake. Yeah, I get it. So if you get it, then you also get that nobody will know we're doing it unless one of us talks. But no one here is thinking of talking, are they? Oh, Lance, come on. Of course not. Great. So is there any more discussion? Because I gotta rest. We all gotta rest. We got more stages, and I'm planning to win. Armstrong's teammates shake their heads, and with that, the discussion is over. Armstrong lies back down and relaxes. He knows he's done his job. This is what it means to be a leader. Sometimes your teammates get scared. Sometimes they don't know what to do. But a leader like Armstrong has to remain clear-headed and focused on victory even if that means acting like a bully every now and then. Because if Armstrong wins the Tour de France, no one will care if he was a little rough on his teammates, if he pushed them too hard to win. None of that matters when you're holding cycling's most coveted trophy for the second year in a row. It's July 17th, 2001 in Ouez, France. Lance Armstrong hurdles over a smooth black road as the wind cuts against his face. 
He's on his bike, standing on his pedals, beginning to climb a hill through craggy mountains. It's steep and punishing, but right now Armstrong feels unstoppable. As Armstrong rounds a bend, he feels driven by his endless desire to win. He's now ten days into this year's Tour de France. Once again, he appears destined to win. That would give him three straight victories in cycling's most prestigious race. Only one other American, Greg LeMond, has ever scored the trophy three times. Armstrong clenches the handlebars as he surges to the head of the peloton, the cycling term for a pack of riders. As he races forward, he can tell that his rivals are gunning for him. There are nearly 150 other cyclists, and he's certain that each of them wants to end his winning streak at the Tour de France. Armstrong doesn't have any plans to lose, but suddenly he senses someone creeping up from behind him. He looks over and is stunned to see four cyclists speeding past him. One of them even chuckles, mocking him. Then the cyclists pedal faster and leave Armstrong behind. Armstrong is enraged as the riders get farther ahead. He can't believe he let this happen. He won't let himself lose, not after enduring such a hard year. Armstrong had a terrible back injury and even faced an investigation over performance-enhancing drugs. That investigation petered out because of lack of hard evidence as well as Armstrong's strenuous denials. But he hasn't fought this hard and climbs his way back only to be left in the dust. For Lance Armstrong, this is his Tour de France, and he's going to win this stage no matter what. Armstrong pumps his legs harder. The spectators on the side of the road begin to blur into colorful streaks. Soon, he catches up to the other cyclists. One of the riders turns around, and his smug expression quickly turns to panic. Armstrong grins, and then speeds up even more. He feels like a predator, closing in on a kill. The other racer leans to make it harder for Armstrong to pass, but Armstrong anticipates the maneuver and glides past him on the opposite side. Armstrong keeps pedaling harder, pushing and pushing. He feels like there's no limit to his power. Coursing through his body is testosterone, EPO, human growth hormone. It feels like there's a current of electricity crackling in his veins. Armstrong then passes two more cyclists, shock on their face as he careens by. He can hear the crowd roaring in a frenzy. Finally, there's just one cyclist ahead, a German named Jan Ulrich. He won gold and silver medals in last year's Olympics and may be the only cyclist who Armstrong thinks could possibly beat him. Armstrong pushes himself further, pulling up next to Ulrich when the road suddenly becomes a steep incline. Armstrong looks over and sees the German racer gasping for breath, drenched in sweat. As the two ride side by side, Armstrong looks directly into Ulrich's eyes and shoots him a look of warning. Ulrich should never again try to pass Armstrong. It was a big mistake. Then Armstrong whips his head back around and takes off. He advances into the lead, certain that he's going to win today's stage, and he has no doubt he'll win the entire Tour de France. Armstrong moves back into the lead. He's a smart racer. He's skilled at reading the road and other cyclists. He's trained harder and longer than most. And yet Armstrong knows it's the performance-enhancing drugs that have put him where he is now at the head of the pack, favored to win his third Tour de France. It's the drugs that have given him his speed and strength and wealth and celebrity. Armstrong knows it's the drugs, and that's why he can never get caught cheating. American Scandal is sponsored by StoryWorth. If there's ever been a year to make the moms in your life feel loved and appreciated on Mother's Day, this is the one. Mothers are the keepers of the flame, the centered hearts of every family, which is why I cherish this book I'm holding right now, a collection of stories written by my mom, prompted and collected by StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps every mother figure in your life share stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. Every week, StoryWorth emails your mom a different story prompt, questions you've never thought to ask. The answers will surprise, delight, and move you, bringing your family close, even if you're not together. And after one year, StoryWorth will compile all your mom's stories, including photos, into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. Give your mom the most meaningful gift this Mother's Day with StoryWorth. Get started right away with no shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash AS. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash AS for $10 off. American Scandal is sponsored by Barbecue Guys. 
I'm not going to tell you my secret to the best ever smoked pork ribs. I won't tell you about the rub or the sauce or any of the steps in the 12-hour process. Because if you were born to grill, you already have your own secret rib recipe. Well, what you may not have is the right grill, smoker, tools, gadgets, and outdoor splendor to make those ribs even better. But the barbecue guys do. Head to BBQGuys.com right now and get 0% APR financing for 12 months on grills, smokers, and outdoor living essentials. And advice, reviews, and recipes from the experts. Finance offer details are available online. Shop now at barbecueguys.com. That's bbqguys.com for those who were born to grill. It's late July 2001 in western Switzerland. Inside the headquarters of the International Cycling Union, Lance Armstrong walks into an office. He meets a pair of scientists who give Armstrong a stern look and invite him to take a seat. Armstrong can tell something is wrong. The union, which is also known as the UCI, sets the rules for international cycling. They're also involved in drug testing. Armstrong just won his third Tour de France, but if the UCI scientists are concerned about something, it could be bad news. Armstrong knows that now there's only one thing to do. Act tough and try to intimidate the scientists. So he says he's not going to take a seat. He's here on time for the meeting they called, he doesn't have time to chit-chat. One of the scientists frowns and says, fine, he'll get to the point. Drug testers found traces of erythropoietin in Armstrong's urine sample. The hormone, also known as EPO, is a banned performance-enhancing drug, and so they need to discuss the findings. Armstrong feels his eye twitch. Then his mind begins to race as he searches for the right response. He knows that whatever he says next could change the course of his career. But before he can say anything, the other scientist says that even though they found traces of EPO, Armstrong's levels were just below the legal limits. There was no actual violation. Armstrong tries to contain his immense relief. He did use EPO. He knows he's guilty. And he also knows why the test result remained low. He injected the hormone directly into a vein instead of under his skin. That makes it harder to detect. Armstrong realizes he needs to leave. The scientists are still discussing his test results, and if he sticks around, they're going to keep asking questions. He might say something he shouldn't. So Armstrong thanks them for their time and explains that he has to be going. Before he can step out of the office, one of the scientists stops him. He tells Armstrong that he should consider this as a warning. From now on, they'll be watching him more closely. If he tests positive in the future, he could be banned from cycling for the rest of his life. Armstrong nods as the weight of the threat sinks in. Then he turns and leaves. A minute later, he reaches the elevator and jabs the down button with a shaky hand. He told himself he would never get caught. He thought he did everything right, but this was too close, and it didn't sound like this is the end of his problems with the UCI scientists. Armstrong will have to be more cautious. No cutting corners, no taking risks. And if caution isn't good enough, if someone is trying to expose him, then Armstrong will have to take other measures. Weeks later, Greg Lamont sits on the patio of his large home in Medina, Minnesota. It's mid-afternoon and outside the birds chirp as Lamont flips through the sports section of today's paper. Lamont couldn't be happier. He just turned 40, but unlike most people his age, he doesn't need to work. In fact, it's been almost 20 years since Lamont felt the pressure to make a dollar. He's a cycling legend and a three-time winner of the Tour de France. By the time he was 23, he'd made enough money to last a lifetime. So Lamont has learned to enjoy the simple things in life, like reclining on a patio and flipping through the paper on a lazy summer day. Lamont feels like he's slipping into a nap when suddenly the phone rings. He considers letting it go. Whatever it is, he can take care of it later. But the phone keeps ringing, and so Lamont forces himself up and grabs it from the table. When he answers, he hears the familiar voice of David Walsh, a journalist who writes for the Sunday Times, a newspaper in England. The reporter asks Lamond if he has a moment to give a comment for a story. Lamond has a feeling he knows what's coming. It's probably something about Lance Armstrong, who's now tied with Lamond after winning his third Tour de France. Sure enough, the reporter brings up Armstrong, 
and adds there's no reason Armstrong couldn't beat the record next year and overtake Le Mans as the greatest American cyclist of all time. And so the reporter says he wants to know how Le Mans feels about all this. Le Mans hesitates. He knows the reporter is looking for a good quote, something that stirs up drama. But he has no interest in taking the bait. Because while he has spoken with Armstrong and finds the man to be rude and self-absorbed, Greg Lamond has no interest in being party to these kind of news stories. So Lamond tells the reporter that records are made to be broken. He wishes Armstrong great success. Walsh chuckles and tells Lamond to cut the crap. He knows that Lamond has heard the rumors. People are talking, and they're saying Lance Armstrong dopes. Lamond pauses again. He had a feeling this was going to come up, but he always sticks by his principles. He tells the truth and admits he has heard some gossip, but he says there's no proof of anything. And as far as he's concerned, Lance Armstrong is just a great cyclist who overcame tremendous adversity. Lamont concludes by saying that this is his official stance on Armstrong until he sees hard proof otherwise. There's silence on the other end of the line, and for a moment, Lamont thinks Walsh might have hung up but then the reporter says that hard evidence may exist. It's just that people don't want to take an honest look at it. Walsh goes on, saying Lamont should look at new reports coming out of the European press, who recently uncovered links between Armstrong and Dr. Michele Ferrari. Ferrari, as the whole world knows, is an Italian who specializes in doping. And Walsh says that with this connection, it's all but confirmed that Armstrong uses performance-enhancing drugs. Le Mans takes a moment to compose his thoughts. He doesn't want to create drama, but he also doesn't want to lie. So he admits that this connection to the infamous Dr. Ferrari is troubling. Le Mans figures there are two possibilities. If Lance is truly clean, then he'll have staged the greatest comeback in the history of sports. And if he isn't clean, then it would be the greatest fraud. Walsh thanks Le Mans and says that's all he needs. The two hang up. As Le Mans sits on his porch, he gets back to reading. But he can't calm his mind, and he keeps replaying the conversation he just had. He hopes he did the right thing. He doesn't want to start an unnecessary controversy. But for Lamond, honesty has always been the best policy. He just hopes that Lance Armstrong feels the same way. A week later, Greg Lamond is sitting in his dining room, reviewing a contract. Lamond may be a former star cyclist, but he still makes a lot of money from endorsements. He has a deal with Trek, the bicycle company, which for years has manufactured road bikes named after Lamont. It's been a lucrative deal and a good source of income that Lamont doesn't plan to lose anytime soon. Lamont is reading through the paperwork when his phone rings. He stands, walks to the kitchen, and picks it up. Hello? Hey, Greg Lamont, it's Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Lance, hey, how are you doing? Well, I was doing great. And I read your interview with David Walsh. Lamont scrunches up his eyes. He prayed this moment wouldn't come. <sighs> okay, Lance, let's talk about it. No, I think you've done enough talking. Now you just get to sit there and listen, okay? Lance, look. No, you look. I race clean, all right? Now, who the hell do you think you are making a suggestion like that? I didn't suggest anything. Lance, I only said... I know what you said, Greg. It's in black and white. Now I'm telling you to keep your mouth shut. Lance, I wasn't trying to offend you, but I think you're out of line talking to me like this. Oh, I'm the one out of line. You know something? I could make things really difficult for you. I could pick up the phone, make a few calls, and you know what you've got? Problems. Your deal with Trek? Gone. Other endorsements? Gone. If I wanted, I could find ten people who'd say you're the one who took EPO. I can ruin you. Hey, I'm not going to just sit here and let you threaten me. Yeah? And what are you going to do about it? You're not going to do anything. You and I both know it. You're a washed-up old athlete, and I'm about to take your record. But remember what I said. These last few crumbs of fame, your endorsement deals, I can take them away. This is your first and last warning. For a moment, Lamont stares at the phone, stunned. He's never received this kind of threat, never been spoken to with such animosity, and he'd never wanted to think that Lance Armstrong doped. But now, with this kind of reaction, there's only one conclusion. Lance Armstrong uses performance-enhancing drugs. Nothing else could have stirred up a response like that. Greg Lamont doesn't want a public fight with Armstrong, but he also won't let himself be silenced. 
He didn't win the Tour de France three times by letting himself be intimidated or by using drugs. So if more evidence surfaces about Armstrong and drugs, Le Mans will keep speaking out. This isn't a question about records or legacies. For Greg Lamond, it's a question of right and wrong. American Scandal is sponsored by Jita. So maybe, like me, you've got a grocery store that you could walk to, but how would you walk back with three full bags but only two hands? Jita is a first-of-its-kind cargo-carrying following robot designed by Piaggio Fast Forward. It removes the hurdles preventing you from living on a more local level. Jita can carry up to 40 pounds so you don't have to, and it moves the way you move so you never have to worry about it keeping up on city sidewalks. It's designed to get you walking more and walking further and to help you be more autonomous in your everyday life. Take 15% off your order and get free shipping always with code SCANDAL15 at myjita.com. It's December 2001 in Austin, Texas. The night has gotten late and crickets chirp in the cool winter air. Everything is quiet on a local highway when suddenly a car's engine comes roaring from the distance. The car flies down the highway, music blaring from its open windows. The car rounds a bend and picks up even more speed as its tires squeal. Inside the car, Floyd Landis grips his seat and holds on for his life. Landis is a professional cyclist. He's used to soaring down the open road at top speeds, but not like this. The driver of the car seems out of control. Landis wants to speak up, to tell him to slow down, be careful. But it's hard to push back when the driver is Lance Armstrong. Landis looks around the car. He's surrounded by his teammates, and they seem just as terrified as he is. Landis looks up and sees Armstrong glaring in the rearview mirror. Oh, you nervous, Landis? No, no. Uh, the first day of training just, you know, took it out of me, man. Normally, a night like tonight, I'd, I'd, I'd be resting up, getting ready for practice tomorrow. Ah, uh, don't worry about tomorrow. I believe in working hard, but you also got to play hard. That's why we're going... Oh, damn, there's my exit. The car barrels down an off-ramp, and Landis grips his seat even tighter. But Armstrong laughs as he pilots the car around a turn. Anyways, that's why we're going out tonight, a night on the town. And here we are, our first stop, boys. Armstrong slows down and pulls into a parking spot, which leads to a lone gray building with a flashing neon sign. It's a strip club. Landis quietly groans. He grew up in a religious family, and this is not his idea of a good night out. But Landis doesn't think he can say anything, especially not when Armstrong turns back to the group, grinning. All right, everybody out. Let's go have some fun. The teammates all cheer and get out of the car. Landis realizes he's going to have to go along. It's his team, too. So he follows Armstrong up to the entrance and past a smiling bouncer. Together, the group enters the dimly lit club. Landis steps past the bouncer and tries to keep his eyes trained on the floor. But someone claps him on the shoulder. He looks up. Lance Armstrong is holding out a few $20 bills. Hey, Landis, you got to loosen up how you win the big races, trust me. Look, Lance, I, I appreciate it, but I, I'm married. So are half the guys in here, including me. Yeah, I, I, I just don't do this sort of thing. <laughs> well, Landis, you do now. Work hard, play hard. That's how we do things. Damn it, go have a good time. Landis swallows. He knows Armstrong is the team leader and the best cyclist in the world. And as a new guy on the team, he should do what Armstrong says. It's uncomfortable, but it's a fact of team cycling. So Landis thanks Armstrong for the cash and makes his way to the bar. Tonight, he'll do what it takes to keep Lance Armstrong happy. He only hopes it doesn't go too far. Several hours later, the party moves to a nearby office building that belongs to Lance Armstrong's agent. Inside, Floyd Landis staggers down a hallway. The night has gotten very late, and now he just wants to go home but he'll stick around until Armstrong decides the party's over. As Landis looks for a bathroom, he hears voices coming from one of the office suites. He peers into the room and is shocked by what he sees. Lance Armstrong is partying with two women who are completely naked. 
and on one of the desks is a white powder that looks a lot like cocaine. Landis stands there, staring, till Armstrong notices. Landis freezes. He probably wasn't supposed to see this, and he's worried about what Armstrong will do next. But all Armstrong does is smile and close the door. Landis hears giggling as he walks away. Suddenly, he's hit with a feeling of dread. He'd heard all the rumors about Lance Armstrong, but he never believed them. He trusted the man, and like most Americans, he considered Armstrong a hero. But Landis is reconsidering. If this is how Armstrong lives, then it isn't too hard to imagine that he would use drugs to win races and that he'd lie about it. Landis wipes his tired eyes and continues looking for a bathroom. He reminds himself that he hasn't seen any actual proof that Armstrong uses performance-enhancing drugs, and he hopes that day will never come. Because if he does, then Landis may get roped into it too. And if that happens, Landis can only pray that he'll have the strength and courage to do the right thing. It's late July 2004 in Medina, Minnesota. Right now, Greg Lamond is staring at a piece of paper that could change his life. He might be about to lose his business deals and his income, all because he decided to stand up and tell the truth. Lamond shakes his head and gets back into the moment. And then he turns to his lawyer. Together, the two of them have a lot to sort out. Lamond knows he'll have to explain the full story, how it all came to this. But no matter how he tells it, Greg Lamond knows the story begins and ends with Lance Armstrong. It started three years ago, when Lamond was living a happy life. He was semi-retired and making good money from his endorsement deal with Trek, the bike manufacturer. Lamond was a cycling legend who had won the Tour de France three times, and so Trek capitalized on his fame and created a line of road bikes named after him. But then everything changed after Lamond spoke with a reporter. He didn't outright accuse Lance Armstrong of doping. But he admitted he was troubled by Armstrong's connection to an infamous doctor who was known for doping. Soon after, he got a call from Armstrong himself, who threatened to destroy him. Lamond was shaken, but more than anything, he realized that he had to keep looking for the truth and speaking out when he found it. Years passed without much of an issue. But just a couple of weeks ago, Armstrong was on the verge of winning his sixth Tour de France. Once again, Lamond was approached by a newspaper looking for an interview. It's common enough, but this time it was a French paper that had long opposed Armstrong. When Lamond spoke with the reporter, he suggested that Armstrong could be doping. The quotes made headlines, and Lamond told himself he wouldn't care if he got another angry phone call from Armstrong. He spoke the truth, and that's what mattered. The angry call never came, but something else did. That's what Lamond is holding in his hands right now a notice from Trek Bicycle Corporation. The company has informed Lamond that they're terminating their partnership with him. The reason they're parting ways is that Lamond spoke out against Lance Armstrong. Lamond rereads the letter, feeling shell-shocked. Trek has sold their Lamond bicycles for years. They're a successful product, and the partnership has been lucrative. He doesn't want to lose this deal, so he asks his lawyer if there's anything they can do. The lawyer says it's pretty clear Armstrong is putting pressure on Trek using the company to get revenge on Lamond. It's payback for talking to the reporters. Lamond knows all this, but he didn't think Trek would be so afraid of Armstrong to fall in line, to cancel their partnership. Lamond buries his face in his hands. He can't remember the last time he felt this miserable and powerless. He tried to do what was right, and because of that, he's being punished. Lamond looks back to his lawyer and asks what, if anything, they can do to fight this. The lawyer sees the dejection in Lamont's face, and after a moment he explains that they can always fight. That's what the law is about, but he can't guarantee they'll win. Lamont has worked hard for everything he's ever gotten. It's impossible to believe that one man, Lance Armstrong, could just take it away. But Lamont realizes that Armstrong can never take away his integrity. Whatever happens with Trek, he'll continue to stand up to Lance Armstrong, not just for himself, but for cycling a sport that he loves and feels obligated to protect. Lamont tells his lawyer he's ready to take action. Lance Armstrong is a liar and a fraud. He has to be held accountable for his actions. Greg Lamont is going to be the person to do it. He isn't scared. He won't back down. Instead, Greg Lamont is prepared to go to war. Next on American Scandal... 
Greg LeMond struggles to find allies in his fight against Lance Armstrong, and Floyd Landis is caught in a difficult position, one that leads to a downward spiral. From Wondery, this is Episode 2 of Lance Armstrong for American Scandal. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen to episodes one week early and ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey to tell us what topics we might cover next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. That's Lindsay with an A, middle initial A, Graham with two A's. Be sure to listen to my other podcast too, American History Tellers and Business Movers. A quick note about our reenactments. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about Lance Armstrong, we recommend the book Wheelmen by Reed Albergati and Vanessa O'Connell. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Barrons. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Hannibal Diaz, edited by Christina Malsberger. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. With ad-free listening, find your next podcast with a premium personalized experience on Wondery Plus, like Against the Odds. This highly immersive series takes you straight into the action of the most thrilling survival stories. Here's a quick preview. But then, something glints in the beam of his roving flashlight. A pair of frightened eyes staring back at him. He can't believe it. There in the shadows, a few feet in front of him, shivering yet alive, is a child. Hello? The child says in a trembling voice. Then, one by one, more silhouettes emerge from the dark. How, how many of you? Thirteen. Brilliant. Rick looks back at John. My God. We found them. We found all of them. Listen to Against the Odds early and ad-free by joining Wondry Plus. Amazon Prime members can get four months free by going to www.amazon.com slash Prime Day Wondery PLUS. Terms and conditions apply. Wondery. Feel the story.